Beloved, you have your, your Bibles, would you join me in Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, thank you honey for making that spiritual psalm before us. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1, and once you find your place, would you stand? Acts 
Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? They said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Beloved, you may be seated. Join me in praying over today's message. I am pure from the blood of all man. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this Lord's day and the privilege to come before you, the audience of one, and these in whom you have ordained should be in this place. We ask now that you would speak in the usual way by your word, by your spirit. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen. It was somewhere around 2006 when my wife strongly urged me that I should go to my pastor, Pastor Dr. Timothy Swan at that time and ask him to pray about my ordination. I was a little reluctant because I came from that school of thought that if you were gonna be ordained, you should be ordained to, because the church is calling you or you're about to go into full-time ministry. I went on and set up the meeting, we had lunch, and walking out of Ruby Tuesdays, I got my nerve up to ask him. I said, Pastor, would you pray about my ordination? And he kind of looked around and kind of did like what only he could do. And looking up in the, like this, he said, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I left there and a little later in the day. And Pastor Trey, I believe, was up at Union before he had transferred down to school down in Newport News. I could put a bub in his car. My wife had praise dance or rehearsal, praise team rehearsal. I said, I, I'm not going to come down the road right now. I'm going to go up to Lifeway Bookstore. <coughs> Went up there and met a fellow that was wearing a whole baseball cap. He started asking me questions <coughs> about who I was. And he said, you know something, young man? He said, I believe the Lord done laid it on my heart that you should replace me as the pastor at Mount Olive Baptist Church up in Mannequin Sabbath. Well, that didn't work out. I went up there and preached. And I'll tell you why I didn't get the church. Primarily for the same reason I hadn't gotten any church. It was because of what, how, who would preach and who couldn't preach. And I've interviewed on a number of occasions. And then one night, Sitting in my study, I get a call from a fellow I'd never met, an elder from the Church of Christ. He had met Trey at that time at Verizon. I don't know what Trey told this man, but he called me and said, you know something? I talked to your son, and he talked about you in such a way that I believe you should be our pastor. This was a Caucasian church. And, uh, but he said, we also have another church that's meeting here, and that was the Community Baptist Church. He gave me a 
information about the Community Baptist Church along with this church. And we didn't show up here until after we moved to Richmond. When I came up, Elder Lee Daniels had me to do a Bible study. And he told me that Pastor Joe Cotman was having back surgery. And the first Sunday that I showed up here was in September. Y'all didn't know anything about me. Not one thing about me. So when I came in, I preached. And the truth be told, I've been trying to leave all the way up until 2021. I was actually being interviewed by St. Luke Baptist Church. When I came here, I was waiting for them to tell me no. Because they wanted to know what I would do with women. When they came in who were ministers, would I let them sit in the pulpit? And I, I told them no, we couldn't sit in the pulpit. I'm just telling you, that's the way it was. But anyhow, four churches I interviewed. I wasn't trying to stay here. I didn't come from a church of this size. I didn't come from a church that didn't have its own edifice, its own property. I came from a crowd of folk. That's not good. I've learned some things where there are a few people. But I wasn't used to this. And I wasn't sure if the Lord could actually use me here. Because everywhere else we ever went, we saw the numbers grow for Bible study. We saw the numbers grow for Sunday school. We saw the numbers grow and some of that was curiosity to see, you know, who might be the next pastor. We want to take a good look at his wife, see what she looks like, and if the children show up, or if she's going to actually be with him every time that he comes. I wasn't trying to stay here. But I'll be honest with you. Where I am in my maturity, and I'll be honest with you, I still don't know no more than Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'd be nowhere near where I am if I went anywhere else. So for that, I thank God for keeping me here. And the thing that was rather profound about this is that that one phone call from Lee Daniels not only brought me here, but it brought my son here. He didn't see it coming because he was out in the world. And all of that took place unbeknowing to us within the sovereignty of God and his providence working out and ordering our steps. What I read to you earlier from Ezekiel chapter 3, Reverend Robert Brown read from Ezekiel chapter 3 at my ordination. Those words dug into me that it was my responsibility as an overseer to make sure, number one, that I keep my hands free of blood of the wicked. And that my hands be free of the blood of the righteous. And that I deliver my own soul. I've had to learn some lessons. And I can say right now, I still don't necessarily know how to preach. But I do know that when this book is open, and the Spirit of God guides me, that the Word of God comes forth. I stand before you, and I've done something that is profound, maybe unprecedented. I made a request several weeks ago that I wanted to meet with all of you, except for the pastors, because I wanted to hear your salvation experience. It was nothing that you had to do, and I finished the last one because I said we wrap it up before this Sunday. I'm done with it now. It's over with now. And when John came by on last evening and sat in the family room and I heard from him, that was it. I was listening to hear the Spirit of God. And I told you this. I said, now what you shared with me and the first one that I interviewed was my wife. Just about all of you would testify and say that when I talked to you, it turned into be a Bible study. Because your experience has to line up with the Word of God. It, it, it doesn't mean that you have a... Because you've got to understand this. Wherever you were when you were saved, the events are different. But that experience as far as what God did is consistent. You heard the gospel preached. And if you were saved, you were convicted 
If you stay around long enough to be convicted by the Spirit of God because of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, that's consistent. You don't get around that. And what is consistent is that the gospel sets forth the greatest story known unto man how that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The gospel testifies that God sent his son and his name is Jesus Christ and that he is the son of God. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, listen, if you missed that part about him dying for our sins, what took place when Christ came into this earth and entered into the suit that he wore, where he was fashioned like a man, that the things that he experienced, the words he heard that were insulting, how he was beaten and battered and spat upon, Everything that happened to him, the nails, the splinters, every, the nakedness, the blood oozing out, all of that was necessary that your sins and my sins could be adequately atoned for. He would have to not only live the life, but Christ would have to die the death. And if you casually heard the gospel and just said, well, yeah, that's something good. I think I can believe in Jesus. Don't you know everyone I know where I came from believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Listen, the demons believed in the death, burial, and resurrection because they were there watching it. You ain't said nothing when you say that. Here it is. It is what has Christ done in you to manifest who? Himself. Amen. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried. And he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So what we did we gave you three probing questions. The other three had a lot to do with the ministry, your pastors, and primarily me. The first, your first responsibility was to set before me something that I shared with you, that when you were first saved, you told everyone about it if you were authentically saved. Amen. Because for some reason, after I was saved, when I went back to where I worked, there were folk that were saved all around me that never witnessed to me, that I never saw Christ in their life. They never showed that any sign that they had been purchased, and not only purchased by God through the blood of Jesus Christ, but that Christ were those, their Savior and the Lord. Now everybody's saved. As I set it up for some of you, I said it would be like you being at the bus stop. You at the bus stop and someone asks you, says, are you a Christian? Tell me about your Christian experience. That's how I set it up with some of you. And that's how it went. And what I was listening for, I'll be honest with you, is for the Spirit of God with what he's done. Because Christ bore our sins, but it was the Spirit of God who made us alive again in Christ. That's what I'm, I'm listening for. I, I wasn't listening for memory. I wasn't listening for a recall. I was listening for something that actually took place that would magnify Christ, exalt Christ. I learned a lot 
about you. Nothing that I can tell anyone about. I made an oath. Except the Lord. But I learned a lot about this church. I learned a lot about what we take for granted. And that is. That old, old story is the gospel. Take that for granted. We take for granted that because people come to a place where there is sound doctrine and things are done decently and in order and maybe set up somewhat like a house church. Because they keep coming back that that means that they're saved. That doesn't mean that no more than going to the beach means you know how to swim. I heard your testimony about your salvation experience. Events were different. That was your business. What God did was his business, and that had to be consistent with Scripture. And I want to say this to you that I talked to, and those of you who are here, is that you have to be able to take your salvation experience and not put it in your own words, put it in the, the words of God. Where it's what God said would happen when you hear the gospel. Number one, you're going to have to have ears to hear. Ears to hear. The second probing question, and by this time, I think with some of you, I said, y'all know y'all done missed the, the bus because you've been a long time telling your salvation experience. And somebody else done got in the conversation. Because the next thing they wanted to know is, do you have any proof of your salvation? Do you have any real proof? And I heard answers. And I'm going to give you what the answer is. And the answer is a God-sized answer that only who would think about doing anything like this other than God. The promise that Christ gave and salvation is that Christ came to bear our sins. But you know that you're saved because God gives you his spirit. He gives you someone equal to the son of God. To dwell with you and be in you. That's more than a promise. And as it is in John 14. He, gonna, he, told, he told those men that God the Father gave him out of the world that this comforter, the spirit of truth will be with you. He's going to dwell with you. He's going to stay with you. He's going to be in you. And you won't know it. And that kind of baffled me when I first saw that because he had already said that the world can't receive the spirit of God because they can't see him and therefore they don't know him. Well, how will you know that the Spirit of God is in you? He's going to make Christ known to you. Amen. You're going to feel like you know him down in your Noah. Down where you know what you know. Like you said, I know my name. Not in the abstract. You're going to know him. Because the scripture says, He's not going to testify about himself. He's going to testify concerning Christ. What he hears Christ say is what the Holy Ghost says. And then, last but not least, and we're just going to look briefly at one part of this text. Somebody asked at the bus stop, well, okay, so you got some proof? That's the Spirit of God? But what kind of fruit? What kind of fruit do you have? Do you have something you hadn't seen before? Manifesting itself in your life. Not that you produced it. Not that you brought it about in your own flesh. Not that you could just bring it up on demand. And that was your third question. I gave you the correct answer. Because we lined it up with scripture. The fruit of the spirit. Beginning with love, joy, peace, 
All nine of them. That was just evidence that those close to you would say, my God. It's like they've been hit over the head with a, with a bucket of love. When they open their mouth, they're loving. When they open the heart, joy comes out. Where is this goodness coming from? I knew him when he was no good. He was nothing. He was low down and dirty. When he was the devil's roadkill. Where is this love coming from? Because we know it's not coming from him. Amen. Now hopefully they said that about you. In our text, briefly, Paul is passing through to Ephesus, and there are 12 men who had been baptized by John the Baptist. They received his baptism. And the question that's asked in verse 2, Paul said unto them, underscore that these were disciples. So that gives us, this is tricky because disciples of who? Well, the text will, it'll, it'll kind of come out and we read it and so that we can get through this because we know what's going to happen next. It is, is that these were disciples, but these were not disciples of Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God is not going to let, like what we heard this morning, God is sovereignly, he's going to make sure that that number, the body of Christ, is not a faceless group of individuals that God was looking at in eternity past, he didn't know all of them. He knew everyone who's going to repent and believe the gospel. He, he, knew, he knew that. And these men, even though they were going about as disciples, they were missing the most important component of being a disciple. And Paul asked this pointed question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe, or actually when you believe. Paul is saying to them, when you believe, wherever you were, that you believe, you would have received the Holy Ghost instantaneously. That's what he's saying. Even though that didn't happen with them, and something different would happen with them, and some have run off with this and said, that's, supposed, that's how it's supposed to happen now, that's not it. It has nothing to do with it. Well, they answered the question. What was the question? Have you received the Holy Ghost? They said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost, which means they hadn't heard. Don't, don't, listen to this. Follow the trajectory of the text. It's not that they didn't know about the Holy Ghost because you're not going to be John's disciple and not know the Holy Ghost. What they didn't know is that the Holy Ghost had been what? Given. So, and he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, well, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Now notice what happened. These were John's disciples. That, and I know this because look at what happens in verse 5. When they heard they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They didn't just drag He's whoa, oh, 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 who, who is Jesus Christ? They already knew that Christ was coming because that's what John preached. But for some reason, they, they missed out on Pentecost. They, missed, they, they, they were outside of this. Wherever they were, they, they did not receive the Holy Spirit. That they should believe on him which should come after him. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, scholars and theologians, expositors have different reasons for this. Peter, within this movement of how the gospel was going forth, laid hands on certain individuals, and they received the Holy Ghost. What this did was authenticate Paul's ministry as being an apostle, that when he laid his hands on them, 12 men, they all received the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to close with this. Once again, beloved, 
I wasn't trying to get in your business. I didn't ask you how much money you had in your bank account, who your friends are. I just wanted to know what your salvation experience was. And did you have any proof that was given to you, really, by God? Did you have any fruit that you have observed in your life and others have testified of it going on? But let me say this to you, and you under the sound of my voice and you hear. If you were interviewed and you said, oh my God, what Pastor Dabney shared with me, I'll be honest with you, I kind of winged that thing. I, you know, I just kind of went through the motion. You know, I really, when, when he was talking about my sin, I wasn't thinking about my sin. I was just thinking about trying to get in. But I wasn't thinking about God's grace and his mercy, or I, was thinking of, I wasn't even thinking about God's judgment. I just was going through the motion. And I'll be honest with you, my life looks like I'm going through the motion. Because I'm still creeping, I'm still slipping around, I'm still sliding, I'm still drinking, I'm still partying, I'm still nasty and low down and dirty. It depends on what day of the week you catch me. Watch this. If you did not receive the Holy Spirit, you are still dead in your sins and you're on your way to hell. Someone needs to put up a road sign and say, listen, stop. Not slow down, stop. You need to repent of your sins. Amen. Because the remedy for sin was just as it was equally necessary for your sins. Listen, when you think about Christ dying for your sins, what he went through, he had to go through it. And he would have to have gone through it just for you. Amen. You're going to come down the aisle and I watch folk walk the aisle. Looking all around, all cheesy looking. Yeah, I'm coming to Christ. You don't come to Christ all cheesy looking. You come to Christ broken. Amen. You come to Christ. You're, we ought to be on our face when we come before him. Not the preacher. Not the elders. We got folk. Much like. Much like. These men that. Paul came upon. In Ephesus. These men were disciples of John. But don't you know that most of the people my age and older, a little bit younger than baptized, they weren't baptized under John's baptism. They were baptized under the church's baptism. Where you just come as you are, continue to live like you were, and everybody's going to accept you. All we want you to do is keep on coming back. Amen. Keep on putting your money in the till. Keep on making the pastor feel good about himself and celebrating and praising God. We all going to go to glory. No, it's not going to work like that, beloved. Amen. You are going to go to hell. If someone needs to tell you this, listen, your life, your life testifies better as to whether or not you saved or not than you could ever testify. That's why I say I, I've labored to keep these free of your blood and to live on my own soul. And it's been to my hurt. This doesn't make you popular. I thought at this juncture I might be in full-time ministry. But who wants anyone who's going to tell you what you can't do? Is that commercial? Down there with the guy selling them cars. Don't tell me what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. That's what the church now is about. Pastor, I don't want you telling me what I can't do. Tell me what I can do. Well, you get both around these parts. I thought. I really thought that the, the church that I was in and were going to, everybody wanted the truth. And we, we all had the same book. How could we end up with so many different formations of the truth? And then I realized something. That when Christ said to his disciples, if the world hate you, know that it hated me. And they hated his disciples. And I don't want to be hated. No minister wants to be hated. When I say, I can't marry you because you've been divorced. I don't, I don't want to hurt you. 
But I say, sis, you can't serve and speak to men in the general council when we come together. I don't mean to hurt you. I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to keep you out of harm's way, out of God's way. Because it is written. But it makes you unpopular. My family would fill this place up. And they'd be parking all out on the street from down King Queen. Those who know me. But this message is not one that folk want to hear. I want to hear this truth. Beloved, the last two, three questions were this, and I'm not going to elaborate on it. I asked you, um, did your pastor teach sound doctrine? In other words, what he's teaching, do, 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 you, do you know what the agenda is? Is it for faith and behavior? That was question four. Question five was this. Does your pastor feed you and, which means teach you and preach? Is he leading you like you are lambs and sheep? Or do you sense that he's driving you like you livestock? <laughs> and then the last question was probably out of those last three was the most important one. Not that you would know everything, because most of us don't know much of anything. And what we do know, we tend to think we know that. But do you believe your pastor loves you? And do you believe that he loves all of the members of this church? That was the inquiry. That was the question. And as I close for the second time, I told you all I'm not going to stay around to hurt you. Before I hurt you, I'll leave you. I'll go. I'll move out of your way. Now, folks never thought I'd leave Hold us back there. She probably never thought I'd leave from that king and queen. <laughs> but I should have left from down there. And I should have left years ago. They never thought I'd leave. I was the last one. Ain't that right, sister? I was the last one. Nobody thought it. And I'm not making no threat. But if I can't help you, why would you want me here to hurt you? All I got for you is the word of God. All I have for you is love. The love that God has put in my heart. Let us pray. Our Father and strong God, we thank you. We sure do appreciate all that you do for us. And how do you speak to us and make the truth of your word just so simple that a little child can just receive it. And every child in here will be able to know that you can't be saved without God's spirit. Because he's the one who orchestrates the salvation. He's the one who does the work. Christ paid the debt, but he does the work of saving us. But I pray that you will save that individual who's under the sound of my voice right now that don't know you and the pardoning of their sin. Might be someone that I've talked to this, these past few weeks that really genuinely don't know. But I'm praying that you save them. Those by way of social media. Those out there in Facebook land and out there in YouTube, Lord, all around the world, that you've saved them. But they realize that they have not the spirit of God. They have their spirit. Save them, Lord. In Christ Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen.